Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ricardo. Um, I've been a software developer for uh, about 10 years now. Um, is that better? Uh, like I was saying, um, I've been a software developer for about 10 years. Um, and in, in these years, um, I've come across just about all kinds of development environments, uh, some pretty good, so some of them not so great. Um, so the reason I'm the reason I'm here today is is um, I wanna I wanna talk to you about 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 a way to to potentially improve the way that 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 you that you develop code. Um, I I believe that having the right setup can uh, can definitely uh, increase. Um, uh, not just the velocity of your of your code, but uh, also the your your own happiness as a as a developer. Um, and so let's uh, jump right into it. Um, and yes, if you're wondering, that is the Cleveland Orchestra. Uh, um, what are the uh, fa the challenges that we face uh, with with development environments? Um, Development environments um, tend to be complex, uh, especially if your project is uh, at a certain uh, maturity level. Uh, it is not just a just a web server and, and a database at, at this point. It'll rely on a number of other uh, services, uh, especially now in the in the in the era of microservices, um, and and so it's not. It's not easy to uh, have a, a, a development a development environment that that closely uh, mirrors uh, your um, your your other environments. Ideally, you would like you you would like your dev environment to be as close as possible as everything else down your pipeline. Um, so, typically, um, when you join a when you join a, a new team. Uh, or a new company, uh, you are met with a massive how-to document uh, detailing every step uh, um, of, 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 of the way in, um, in, in order to, to get your, your application up and running. The problem is these, these documents, uh, they, they tend to not always be accurate, um, uh, Maintaining those um, is is not it's usually no one's no one's job, uh, and so problems arise when 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 it when it comes to when it comes to onboarding new members. Um, it's it's time consuming. It's and and it's it's costly to your team, and um, there's um, you know it just causes um, a bunch of misery. Um, and then there's the um, time where you're at step 99 out of 100 and then the entire thing just goes bonkers and and no one knows no one knows what it is and although your teammates are trying to help you they can only just shrug and say it works in my machine right it's like it's like we've you know kind of all familiar with that that uh, phrase um, and so, and, and, and the other the other issue is um, having your development environment environment be consistent, uh, uh, not just not just across environments like, like I mentioned before, but um, have a way to build it consistently uh, in in any developer workstation, uh, regardless of the operating system that that they are using. This is sometimes this is sometimes an issue with uh, with remote teams. Um, where folks are not necessarily uh, using the same sort of machines as as the folks on site. So one solution, um, one common solution has been for years the the virtual machine, right? So you bake all of your software and your dependencies and all of your services into into a virtual machine, and then you just kind of throw it out in the world and to your, uh, try to distribute it uh, amongst your team, but um, 
there's there's issues with it. Um, uh, one issue is it's um, it's really resource intensive, right? Uh, uh, virtual virtual machines tend to be, um, in general, uh, CPU and and memory hogs uh, to the point that you might find your workstation maxed out by just running your your development environment. Um, they're tricky to distribute. Um, the virtual machine images are in the um, tens of gigabytes of size uh, sometimes. Uh, let's not forget that um, they are full-blown operating systems that run as, as guests on top of your host uh, um, operating system. And uh, obviously, with use in virtual machines, there's also a, a learning curve. Not, and not everyone in, in a team may be um, um, immediately familiar with how the in and outs of um, a VM works. And then there's provisioning and configuring and troubleshooting and provisioning again. Um, yeah. So what I think a better solution is um, containers. Um, containers uh, allow you to define, uh, define an application um, where each component is isolated as a, as a container. Um, now, this is a more lightweight solution. Um, again, generally speaking, uh, images um, for uh, containerization are, for the most part, um, really a slim down versions of uh, a certain flavor of Linux so that they only come with the uh, bare minimum of uh, things that um, required for, uh, for, uh, for, a, for a process to run, let's just say. Um, they're easy to distribute. Um, uh, configuring uh, containers is usually done by plain text files. So that's really easy to put in your repo and, um, and just have the entire team use it. Provisioning is, is fast. Um, um, especially, um, especially after, after creating the, the environment for the first time, um, there is caching happening er at every step of the way with, uh, with containers so that, um, any any part of, of of your app definition that hasn't changed when it comes to recreating that environment um, because it is cached, then uh, there's no need to do it again. There's no need to re-download an image that you already have. There's no need to reinstall requirements that you already have, um, etc. Uh, better flexibility, um, and this is because um, once 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 you have your uh, containers set up, it's uh, fairly, uh, fairly uh, um, trivial to, to add and, and remove components as your, as your changes need, uh, as, you, as, your, as, as your needs change, as part of me. <coughs> um, but of course, just like with uh, virtual machines, um, there is, there is a, a learning curve. So it's not, it's not all, you know, it's, not all free, right? So Docker is um, is, the, is is the most uh, is is a de facto um, uh, container containerization engine. Uh, there are now alternatives, um, but uh, Docker continues to be the uh, the the default option um, for creating containers. Um, containers run di uh, run directly with the uh, with the host uh, operating system uh, kernel, um, and, and that and that increases the uh, the uh, the agility at, at which um, um, an application inside a container can can execute, and and that's where the the uh, um, the efficiency part is uh, comes from. Um, you can you can build images. Uh, and customize them to your needs using pre-made images in container registries. Uh, the default container registry for Docker is is Docker Hub, um, but you can you can set up your environment to use other other registries. 
Um, but I find that that's, um, that is a really good um, collection of, of, of images to, to get started with and, and, and build your own environment uh, from. Uh, Docker also gives you the ability to, to run multiple container, uh, containers, and, 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 that, and that makes sense for, for our use case, because what we want to do is, is convert uh, each and one of our um, components into, into a container. But now you you need a way to manage um, all of these all of these containers, right? And that is where Docker Compose uh, comes into play. Um, Docker Compose uh, is a tool that comes with Docker. Um, well, in Linux you have to kind of install it um, manually. I think it's still the case. Um, but it allows you to to define a multi-container um, application using using Docker containers. So it basically allows you to define how each of your containers is going to start up and um, what sort of environment uh, they're going to use, volumes, et cetera. Um, configurations files that, that are used in Docker Compose is the, well, uh, first uh, Docker Compose dot YML. And it'll also make use of any Docker files that you have already uh, generated for your project. Um, we'll talk about these more um, as part of the as part of the example. Um, uh, I've prepared a sample um, Dockerized Django app. Um, and this app is going to be is going to be configured um, to use um, uh, Postgres uh, po uh, Postgres as, as a database and, and Redis as a, so Redis is usually nor, uh, used as, as a cache. Uh, in this case, we're um, going to use it um, as sort of a queue broker uh, for uh, allowing our um, task worker to, to communicate. Um, we're going to set up a, a Celery uh, worker. Now onto the Docker file. So the Docker file, you, you can think of it as, as a recipe for, for building images. Um, the syntax um, is pretty straightforward. Um, a, an, an important keyword here is from, um, which is gonna allow you to pull an image that is already existing in, in the registry, in the uh, Docker Hub, for example, registry, and, and pull a specific version of it. So that takes care of creating uh, your, your runtime, your Python runtime. And then you're just adding certain, um, um, you're creating um, a directory for your code to be deployed, and then just adding your, your requirements for your, for your um, Django, um, for your Python dependencies to be, to be installed automatically. The Docker Compose YAML uh, defines uh, your services, and you'll see that in a, in a moment. Um, volumes and networks. Uh, now, volumes. We need volumes because um, Docker containers are volatile. They, don't, they do not maintain any, any data after, they, uh, after you've stopped them. So you need to, you need to associate, if, uh, if you need to um, persist Data, data, and you probably want to do this as part of your development environment, <laughs> right? Um, uh, you uh, you want to uh, make use of the volumes uh, uh, feature, and then as far as networks, um, unless you're doing something uh, really complicated, um, Docker Compose already takes care of creating a network when you up your environment that allows each component defined in that compo in, in in that environment to communicate with each other uh, with each other. So. Um, so that's what um, that's what Docker Compose uh, Docker Compose file looks like. Um, uses the uh, YAML syntax, um, and it may seem like a lot for for a slide, but keep in mind that this is this is everything. This is this is your this is your this is your development environment basically, um, and. In, 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 in our case. Um, 
So as you can see, um, the syntax here defines a number of services. DB is our database. Redis is our cache slash um, broker. Web is our Django app. And then Worker is our Celery um, task, task Worker. Um, Each of these sections define how the how the service how the service is supposed to what image the 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 each service is supposed to use. So, for example, we we see in in the database um, that it's used in Postgres. So that's pulling uh, the latest Postgres uh, image available in, in in Docker Hub. You can also specify versions using tags if you need to target a, sp a specific version. And then if you look at the Redis service, um, it says Redis colon Alpine. Uh, what this is doing is, 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 pulling, is pulling a Redis image, but a specific um, flavor of Linux called Alpine, which is known for um, being the most lightweight. They're really, really small images, uh, sometimes just um, 30 megabytes or something like that, something really crazy small. Um, so it's perfect if you don't need anything, you don't need any bells and whistles other than, you know, what it already um, comes with with, uh, with with an image. And then in web, um, the uh, build command um, has a dot in it. That that indicates that it should look for a Docker file in the current directory and build an image from there. See how there's no image. Um, um, construct in there so that's going to look for a docker file and then build our python runtime using using the docker file that we saw earlier the um, command um, is your entry point is um, what that container is going to execute um, once it starts up containers um, well, the Docker philosophy uh, philosophy is that each container runs one process. So, in this case, when that container starts up, that it, that's going to be the main, the you know PID one in in that in that container, the one um, process. And then uh, the volumes volumes portion um, defines how we map our current working directory, indicated by a dot, with the um, app directory that we created in, in, in the Docker file, so that your code changes will be um, available immediately uh, in, inside the volume of your container. That's how, you, that's how you make your changes into the container, and then um, it'll refresh and you'll be able to to see them and then finally it depends on is going to ensure that whenever whenever the web service gets started it's, it's also going to make sure that that the DB that the, the database service is also running and then lastly um, you need to you need to hook up your Django app to use these services that we just created. So this is just one example of how how you would point your Django app to to the Postgres database that we that we've defined. Note that in the um, host line, this just says DB. So in our in our Docker Compose file, we define the the P Postgres database as as DB. That's not just the name of the image as Docker refers to it, but it's also going to be the host name in the network that is created for these components to, um, to interact, right? So then when I, when I point to my DB, I just use DB instead of local host or an IP address. And then you just run Docker Compose up. Docker Compose up brings up the entire environment that we just defined. It kind of looks like this. Um, see how it brings up um, each, each of the components that, that, we, that we defined uh, successfully, and then we're able to access the, the app 
on uh, on our browser, the uh, the the default um, default Django um, welcome screen. And that's it. We we built we built a, um, a development environment with uh, a number of services um, that goes beyond the you know uh, the you know like a simple a, a simple setup uh, with Django uh, as you as you get started. Um, and um, I've also um, created a repo with the um, with the source code for this, so that if you'd like to play around with, uh, you can you can clone it and and um, and take it for a spin. Now, just a quick primer, a quick primer on on the Docker Compose command command line interface. So we've seen so far um, Docker Compose up that. It not only brings up the environment; it actually it will build the the environment if it's if it's not already built. Um, and then, so you think down is just going to bring it down? Yes, but um, careful because um, it will also using down will also remove uh, any volumes that 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 you define. So you will potentially lose your uh, your dev data. I mean, it, it's not a big deal, but you just have to recreate it. So your normal workflow won't be Docker Compose up, and then when you're done, down. You will. It'll be more like up and then stop, right? Um, if there are no changes to pick up in in your in your configuration, you can just use the start to bring it up and stop. It it, it just um, if you make any changes using those. Um, to your configuration using start and stop or, or restart, which is just a shortcut, uh, it will not pick up those um, configuration changes. Uh, PS just displays any, ser any containers running or services running. Logs will um, output all of the logs from, from, each, um, from each running container. Um, and you can also uh, target specific containers. Uh, so you can just say Docker Compose logs web will just output your Django um, uh, your Django output. And um, run and exec may sound may, 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 may sound like, like synonyms, uh, but they do different things. Uh, so they're both used to run commands, to execute commands uh, inside inside a running container. But the difference is that um, one of them will do it in a in creating a new instance of that container and that's run and exec will use the existing container rather than creating a new one and then rm is just kind of a housekeeping um, command to delete any any stopped container some caveats um, so Docker is great and it brings a lot of advantages, but you're still adding another layer into your stack, right? So with all that comes with that. So if there's a vulnerability out there for an image that you're using, that that could hit you, right? So it's something something to keep in mind. Um, like any like any big change, it it will take some time to to get your setup uh, right. But I, I do believe it's worth it. Once once you have it running, uh, it's really easy to recreate your environment um, in a way that is that is um, um, that is consistent. Um, one thing I found is uh, debugging can be a little bit tricky, um, but that's just that's just the nature of how uh, containers work. Um, Right out of the bat, they don't expose a terminal that your debugger can attach to. So you have to run your container in a different mode. You have to use the run command and then expose uh, your your ports and sort of do a remote debugging type of setup. So a little tricky, but um, you can do it. Um, and then about the performance. So when, when it comes to running the app, the uh, the performance is just fine, um, but 
um, I have noticed that running uh, running unit tests, especially if you have hundreds of unit tests, those take those take quite a hit. I don't know if anyone has had the same experience. Uh, I'd like to um, pick your brain if um, if that hasn't been the case for you. Of course, you can fix that by uh, running tests in parallel, but it may not be an option for for everyone. Other caveats include really long commands. So once your application is containerized, so using Django commands, those were already pretty long as they were, right? Uh, you know, Python managed by make migrations, uh, you know, migrate my app or create super user. There's super long commands. Well, prepend docker compose exec and then the name of your container to that every time so yeah alias is definitely your friend make as many as you can to improve your your workflow or you're gonna end up with a tendonitis just by <laughs> yeah i'm telling you um what else uh so okay all of this being said you don't have to go full docker uh, right off the bat uh, so um, this solution is flexible enough that you can decide to just sort of uh, take your services and dockerize those uh, while you run your your core your core code your core application still locally Django is fairly easy to install and these days um, Python installers have gotten way better you have um, pip env um, that can create a runtime for you real quick and then and then install and and then you just install your dependencies using the the good old way uh, using pip or uh, what have you um, but your um, other components which are typically um, tricky to 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 run across um, different workstations or different flavors of um, uh, operating systems, you can take care of that by by defining those in Docker. And in conclusion, uh, Docker Compose um, can speed up development. Once you get it right, it can speed up. You can <laughs> it can only speed up your development. It can it can it can improve your happiness. Um, uh, it'll definitely make. Um, set up a lot less frustrating for you and who knows um, it, if you uh, decide that you want to use containers in your uh, other in your other environments during during deployment or even in production this could be the start to um, containerize your your pipeline um, and that's uh, that's all I got if you have questions please feel free to uh, find me uh, outside in the hallways and um, thank you so much for being here